Here we go. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells. This is a special episode and interview. As many of you know, we feature content from Dr. Michael Heiser, and we constantly interview top-rate scholars like N.T. Wright, Matthew Bates, and Tim Mackey of The Bible Project. And we ask them questions that engage with Heiser's work and the Divine Council worldview. One of the missions of this channel is to help keep Heiser's voice and teachings alive. We have discovered that even after his popularity and passing, the scholarly world, for the most part, has yet to wrestle with or digest Heiser's work. I've recently been intrigued to see how the next and upcoming generation of scholars are receiving the unseen realm and all of Heiser's work. Luckily for us, Dr. Carmen Imes, a friend of this channel, introduced me to our guest today, Robert Mark Reasoner Jr., a bright and upcoming scholar who is a student of Carmen's at Biola University. Robert is also a fan of Heiser's work. Robert is already a published author with a Hebrew language illustrated Bible series. He's currently studying biblical languages at Biola University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show with me, Robert Mark Reisner. Thank you. All right. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to just have another fellow Bible nerd to just have some great conversation and digest some awesome content with. So thanks for being here today, Robert. Thanks for having me on. I'm a huge fan of the work you're doing. Um, I just watched some of the uh, Opkalu uh, episode last night. So I really love all the edits that you're doing and just everything that you're putting out. Man, that means a lot. Thank you, brother. So um, tell us, Robert, because <clears throat> I think it's interesting to get some like foundational kind of information. Um, tell us a little bit about the upbringing of your faith. Give us a glimpse um, on how the story of the Bible was first presented to you and your upbringing of faith. Yeah, so I grew up uh, Southern Baptist tradition. Um, at a private Christian school. So mostly everything that was taught to me was just like a conservative evangelical viewpoint. Um, I, I didn't actually know that there were any other theories of atonement um, until I went to Biola University. And I'm not saying that's a fault of, of, of uh, my school or, or anything that I grew up in, but you know, going to Biola really broadened my faith uh, from my tradition. Uh, that I was that I grew up in, and, and that's a little bit of part of my journey. And Heiser's work is a huge part of that. That's awesome. So I, I follow some of that same sentiment. <clears throat> and for me, even uh, when I went through Bible college, I didn't even discover it then. It was even after those stages that that this stuff all started to kind of marinate through in that that moment of deconstruction. So thanks for for sharing that. So what prompted you to go into biblical studies? You know, that's a big. You know, I, I'd say it's a big thing to uh, to do. It's it's a uh, it's a leap uh, to go into biblical studies and say that's what you want to do for your life. So, what what prompted you to do that? Yeah, for me, it was it was just felt completely natural. Um, I grew up loving ancient history. I loved the ancient Mesopotamian uh, history as a kid in like fifth grade, and I loved um, the Prince of Egypt movie as a little kid. And I just I just always loved the Old Testament reading the Old Testament. Um, so my, my upbringing was in a Christian school and I just loved uh, reading the Bible. So it was kind of just like, you can, you can do that and get a degree for it. So it was just felt completely natural. And, and that's kind of what, what prompted me to do it. So. Wow. You've always had it, had that, that love in you. That's cool, man. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful world that you just, you can never explore it enough. So like we said uh, in the opener, we're a huge fan of Dr. Carmen Imes here at Ring Them Bells. I believe one of, she's one of the top scholars in her field. I believe she's one of the best communicators in the world personally. Um, and she has a gift from God uh, to communicate biblical knowledge. Um, I was wondering if I you agree. could give us a, a couple insights uh, into what it's been like for you to be a student of Carmen. Yeah, it's been great. Um, her classes are, they, they fill up super fast and um, she's such a great communicator in the classroom. And one of the biggest things for the class that I TA for is she will not only try to just teach you and, and indoctrinate you with something um, like, like some professors might, but she'll want your opinion and want to wrestle with that through you. Uh, I mean, wrestle with that 
w- wrestle through that with you. Um, yeah. So she's going to be really open to hearing different perspectives in the classroom and discussing it and coming to biblical truth through that instead of just giving a lecture. Um, so I think that in a classroom, that's one of her biggest strengths. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. like see- I'm super thankful for that. Yeah, I've 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 would love to maybe who knows what the future holds, but I would love to take a class from her because every time I've heard her speak, it's been it's been incredible. Um, so here's an interesting question though: What was the hardest part about taking Carmen's class or Dr. Ryan's class? Uh, what was what would you say was one of the most difficult parts? So I only took one of her classes, and and I think it was two years ago, um, and it was biblical background, so ancient like history. Uh, so Greco-Roman backgrounds and ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. Um, I mean, like there's a lot of reading, but that's with any class. So I would say like the hardest part is just doing the reading, um, in school, which is what every class has, but there's not anything super hard about it. It's just fun discussions. And a lot of times she, she won't only try to talk about the material and the content, but she'll talk about how to go into the field of biblical studies, whether you want to be a pastor or if you want to be a scholar, um, kind of prepping you for that is something unique that she brings to the classroom as well that other professors I, I haven't seen. So, Yeah, uh, I interviewed one of her professors. I don't know if you've seen this interview that I put out uh, for Ray Lubeck. And that's a trait that I believe she got from many people, but I think from Ray as well. And that's really cool to hear. So <clears throat> what we're going to do uh, to that point, uh, Carmen Imes, Tim Mackey, Ray Lubeck, um, and N.T. Wright have all been very pivotal in my recent discovery on how wrong we've been to hold women back from leadership and preaching positions in our local churches. Um, I wonder if you'd watch this collaboration with me with Carmen and uh, J.M. over at Disciple Dojo on uh, a video, uh, What Does the Bible Actually Say About Women in Ministry? Let's check this out. Isn't it striking that Jesus never gives instructions that limit women from doing anything? Mm. Like, so we got two verses in Paul that seem to do so. But we have Jesus with three years of earthly ministry, and he had opportunities where he could have said, no, women, this isn't a good place for you. Um, But he allows women to travel with him, to provide for his needs. He allows Mary to sit at his feet, learning from him like a rabbi. And when when her sister says she should be in the kitchen, uh, Jesus says, no, she's chosen what's right to, to be my disciple. And then, and then I think what was maybe the first thing that just sort of knocked me off my feet uh, as I was thinking about this issue was that was recognizing that all four gospels record for us that Mary Magdalene was the first to see Jesus after his resurrection and that he commissioned her to bring the most important theological message in human history to his own disciples. It is true that Jesus chose 12 male followers. I think in so doing, he was reconstituting Israel, like a new Israel around himself. So he's symbolically choosing the 12 uh, tribes again. But the, the Gospels are very clear that women traveled with him, that they were part of the disciples as he sent them out two by two to do gospel ministry, that the women are among them, that... Um, at the day of Pentecost, there are women present who begin prophesying that um, at his ascension, there are women who are seeing him received from their sight. So women are witnessing the most important aspects of Jesus' ministry where he's commissioning them. All of us are supposed to go and make disciples, not just men. And so I think it's I think it's important for us to recover this because there seems to be a sort of awkwardness or hesitance in the church that like, well, the women should just hang back and let the men do this. And right. I would argue like we need all, we need the whole body of Christ to do this, to carry out this commission well. And we can say amen to that. Uh, very informative video and channel there uh, from Disciple Dojo and Carmen. I was wondering just before I say anything, what was your take on this subject of women leading in the church? Yeah, yeah. Um... That's funny. That's funny that you play that video because when you sent me the questions beforehand, I I put that in my notes that, to recommend uh, that interview. 
if anybody out there was watching. I think that um, even what she said about the two passages in Paul, I think one of the things that Tim Mackey does really well and uh, Heiser and uh, Carmen Imes is, you know, reading the Bible in biblical theology and reading it through the entire lens of all of scripture. And I think when you take two, one or two passages in Paul and then just start proof texting and kind of clobbering people with it, I think that we can get into dangerous territory. Um, I wanted to bring up that passage, 1 Timothy 2.12, that is often quoted against women who shouldn't be preaching. And then I wanted to kind of contrast that with 1 Corinthians 11.15. So if you say that a woman should never teach in church at all and have no teaching um, role or preach at all, then how would she go up in front of the church and need to have her head covered when when prophesying? So I think that's one thing that people often don't don't think about. Like, you're are, do you want to say that Paul's contradicting himself, or or do you want to reconcile that somehow uh, when you're not looking at things in the scope of biblical theology and you're just pick it you know like picking passages like a tree i mean like apples off of a tree i just don't think it works no dude that's incredible well well said and i even have like as my one little discussion points with you is like head coverings and women not speaking and that and you just you touched on that that wonderfully but uh, another thing uh, and, and maybe you've heard me say it before in this channel is that the beginning is near and and that can mean a few different things for for me, but one of them specifically is that the the as we read through Scripture, uh, there's a focus and connection to the Garden of Eden and to Genesis almost consistently uh, throughout as as we go through to to understand that the beginning is near. And when we enter into the discussion of understanding uh, the equality or roles of men and women, we need to start at the beginning. And in that same um, uh, video that you you highlighted, I agree. Uh, they they talked about this so well, and this is something I learned from Carmen to really understand uh, the 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 roles of male and female is that we both represent the image of God. God didn't choose just one to represent the image. He used a, a community of male and female connected together. Um, and her work uh, on something I'm going to be sharing recently, uh, uh, soon, is uh, on the Azer uh, when it says helper, has, how we have it defined yeah. it. Uh, she, she has ally, Azer. and um, she's Carmen Imes' definition is ally. And then even Tim Mackey says that it's like a redeeming or recovering ally. Uh, he kind of even expounded further on it, and I love that because that's what it is. When we look at the garden, when we look at Genesis, it gives us a clear picture of men and women made in the image of God, ruling as priests and authority with no distinction. And and you know, it's 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 uh, very apparent even you know as we get into the Gospels and the few verses in Paul, we have to wrestle with those and not just push them to the side. And I'm so. I'm so proud of you for how you just explained that because we're not pushing them to the side. We're going to wrestle with these things and understand them in the full scope of scripture like you just did so well. So for my next one, maybe you can help with this. What do you think as, as someone who's up a coming scholar, what are some things that we can do to help write this ship? That, yeah. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing for, for one of the biggest things that set me off is I read this book called finding Phoebe I can't remember the name of the author, but it's a pretty good book. And reading the Bible through its cultural lens, like Dr. Heiser talks about, I think opens up everything for this topic. Um, and and also reading it in through biblical theology, through the entire uh, view of Scripture. So I think when you do both of those things, uh, that's that's kind of where we can turn the ship. But specifically with the cultural context. Uh, look at the Samaritan woman that Jesus encounters. I think that not only have we done this with kind of the egalitarian complementarian debate, but we've also pushed a lot of women to the side in scripture and not recognize uh, the, the presence of women in scripture like like Dr. Imes uh, talked about in that clip. So with the Samaritan woman, we've always talked about her as having all these husbands and she was in sin this whole time. But what about the cultural context of leveret marriage that maybe yeah. she, you know, maybe her husband died and then the brother had to step in or, you know, all of these things like like we don't know what happened, but we just want to automatically assume that that, you know, she left her husband or had a ton of husbands and that 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 was because of her sin. 
um, you know, and, and just and just like skipping over a lot of the women in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. So, yeah. Yeah. To that point with the woman at the well, too, it's like uh, I think I learned this. Not think I know I learned this from Dr. Imes as well, is that, you know, they could just easily dispose of a woman in marriage. They could say anything that they just thought that they had a dream that she was cheating on them and, you know, whatever. Actually, Jesus even addresses this in the Gospels, um, this specific question. They kind of bring up this debate. And, yeah, I think that's 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 really important. And you give me a lot of hope, Robert, for the way that you're approaching it and thinking about this. And it's not a right or wrong. I just like the foundation and the biblical principles that you're approaching this from. And, and, and I think that that is going to shine through, man. So keep that up. Um, so the the Unseen Professor, tell us about how and when you first discovered uh, Dr. Michael Heiser's work. Yeah, so for me, it was my first year of uh, college, you know, doing biblical studies. And I had this three-hour class, and it was getting kind of long. And a lot, a lot of my Bible classes are super fun and interesting, but this one, I just, we just needed a break. Uh, it was just going on so long and we just, we, so my friend and I were like, Hey, let's just step out for, you know, five minutes and then we'll kind of talk about theology. Uh, what are you thinking about? And you know, what topics are in your mind? And then we kind of discussed that. Um, and then we're like, all right, then we'll go back in class. So we stepped out of class. <laughs> so for, for five or 10 minutes, and then he goes, Hey, did you know that the Bible translations that they're trying to camouflage the Bible and what it actually says. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Camouflage the Bible. And then he goes, yeah, look at this. Look at the NIV translation of Deuteronomy 32 and look at the ESV translation of Deuteronomy 32. And then he pulls it up and he's like, yeah, look at this. One of them says the sons of Israel. One of them says the sons of God. And then he's like, this is actually about the Tower of Babel and, and that God set these like sons of God over the nations. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? It, but that bugged me that that was the first, um, you know, critical issue that I had ever heard of. And um, now I've gone into, you know, studying Hebrew and doing some text criticism on my own, um, which uh, Biola, which is awesome. But that was my first introduction to the Unseen Realm. So the Deuteronomy 32 passage means a lot to me. And then he was like, yeah, you need to read this book called the Unseen Realm. So then I got it. And I originally actually got it on the audio book. But I tried to listen on the audio book. And then I was like, this is not working. Like, this is too much. Uh, I can't even take this in. So I bought the actual book and then started reading it. And I was like, this changes everything. It, I mean, what is the divine counsel? Like, why have I never heard this in my entire life of growing up in, you know, uh, evangelical Christian community? Uh, you know, like I just talked about earlier, my whole life. So I don't know how I had never heard of a divine counsel before, but this is like central to the to the authors of Genesis and Deuteronomy. So. Yeah, you had your own Psalm 82 moment, just like Heiser. I don't know if you ever heard his story, but that's it's yes. it's actually very yeah, that was my watershed. Yeah, very similar to yeah. what you just said. That's really cool. So, in your experience, uh, how um, has Heiser's work been received with other students in ministry? Yeah. So, um, in Dr. Carmen's class, we assigned some chapters of the Unseen Realm for the Biblical Backgrounds class, and that went really well. I think that uh, this, a lot of the students loved it. Um, I feel like Heiser's work sometimes doesn't sit with everybody where you might just be like, oh, yeah, divine counsel, that's cool. Like, it's not really going to change my theology. But some people are just like, wow, that that blows my mind. And and some, one, one of the students came up to me and he said, every time I read Heiser, he just completely blows my mind, like every time we read him. And uh, some of the students decided to write their papers on some of the topics in the unseen realm, like the Jude six passage and and the um, Psalm was it Psalm eighty two? I think I think Psalm the Jude two. six passage, the Jude six passage was um, the most popular one with the Genesis six passage as well. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's been received very very well with the younger people, but we've also got so many voices. You know, and you, and it's hard to just have one 
voice. I don't think anybody should just be listening to Heiser. I mean, we should be doing what you're doing and listening to all these different people. So yeah, I appreciate that. That's what I try to do. Everybody, it, it, it's, I don't have everybody, but I, I try to create a well-rounded experience. Um, but that's uh, important to understand that from Heiser, and it's good to hear that that yeah. that you guys are having you know that there is openness to his work because I've sensed in the scholarly world even to this day that there's still a little hesitancy in our modern Western world to kind of dive into these supernatural topics. And then what he, your friend even said about the text, you know, um, as I look back through not just recent translations, but you go back through church history, and there's a pretty significant effort to push this stuff under the radar um, as time goes on and almost initially. I so I think that that's, that's so uh, one other question, have you, does any pushback for you? Has there been any pushback for you in whether uh, from, you know, other kids or a academics or whatever, any pushback from uh, adopting this divine council worldview or understanding the Bible and through that lens? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's definitely some pushback, um, when you, when you adopt anything that's a little bit different, uh, it's kind of been harder. I don't know if you've had this experience or if other people have, but when you get down the divine council worldview kind of realm, it's harder to come back into conversations and just say something and somebody automatically understand what you mean by that, or to even engage with a conversation because you have so much different presuppositions. Now yeah. the, the presupposition that you're coming to the text with you're going to be wanting to read the text in the ancient Israelite worldview or in the, author, in the context of the original authors, not through church history or your own tradition. So something like, I know that the Calvin Calvinist debate, you know, I feel like these are things that Paul isn't even concerned with or talking about at all, but that's like Amen. a big thing right now. And, and I mean, I don't even think that like the, the election, the way that we even think about it is the same thing that the biblical authors would have. So it's like, I'm on just a totally different radar. So it's kind of hard to come back. Uh, I think that would be one of the biggest things. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. That, that I think that I really appreciate your answer on that because the pushback almost is the awkwardness and trying to have even casual conversations about basic concepts right. that we're working through in scripture because they're tied to, you know, this ancient Near Eastern context and not this modern Western evangelical yeah. context that we find so many in. But that's why I'm glad to have this conversation with you, brother. Um, so let's let's do this, man. Let's dive in. Um, I've prepared four awesome clips from Heiser that I'd love to share with you. And then we kind of go total Bible nerd out and just have discussions about them. Um, how's that sound to you? Great. Perfect. Um, as always, as we said, the beginning is near. We're going to start at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. The fall, of course, we're familiar with. I view this as a divine rebellion story. That doesn't mean that, you know, Adam wasn't there and Adam didn't sin and, you know, Adam's sin really had a, a profound impact on humanity. Of course, all those things are, are kind of no-brainers. But you would be amazed at how many evangelical Old Testament scholars do not want to put too much emphasis on the Nakash, the serpent figure, in the story and absolutely refuse to look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 as having anything to do with that story. Now, there are academic scholarly reasons for that. And I, I will, since I'm being recorded, let me be careful. That's nonsense, okay? <laughs> We're dealing with more than a snake. In other words, Genesis 3 is not teaching us a zoology lesson. But in Isaiah 14, this individual decides, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, I, I want to be like the Most High. I will be the most high. I want to be the one in charge of this. I don't like God's decision to make humans part of our family. Okay, I want to be the ruler of the council. You know, you'll get language like this in these passages, where Eden is the, is the cosmic mountain, the, the place where God dwells. Again, portrayed as a mountain because it's remote and transcendent. You have this individual rebelling and being cast out cast away, but not before enticing humanity to rebel. 
So we have rebellion in the supernatural world and the human world. Revelation 12 and 20, this individual is identified as the serpent or the devil, God's original, the original rebel who becomes sort of God's original adversary. And the cost of his rebellion is death to humanity and estrangement, separation from God. But the heart of the story is a supernatural rebellion. Before I offer some discussion points about that, what are your initial thoughts from that clip about Eden as a divine rebellion? Yeah, um, for me, I think the Ezekiel 28 passage, I haven't been like fully convinced that it's talking about the, the snake there. I mean, I could be convinced, but I don't, I don't actually think that you need that to have a divine rebellion. I think that you could get the divine rebellion from just the Genesis uh, 3 text itself, like he's talking about the Nechash, um, that that word kind of has a, a, triple, it's a triple entendre, so it's got multiple different meanings. Uh, it could be diviner, it could be shining one, or a snake, or, I mean, when you get into, like, lexicography, it, it gets heated sometimes with, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of nerds debating how to... Uh, define words and, and what the semantic range is and but I mean you could take any of those three in the scope let's say like the scope of the semantic range and I think that you could have a supernatural rebellion from that and you know from our upbringing uh, with me and you like how did you even answer the question why is a snake in the garden you know beforehand I think I think Tim Mackey uh, and Heiser have kind of offered a better answer that you know, this is this snake is one of the divine council members when he says, like, let us make man in our image. And when they eat of the tree, like he tells the other council members, like, you have become like one of us knowing good and evil. Yeah. So I think that that just shows God's family in, in Eden already there. And I think that going, even tying this back into the women in ministry thing, we've kind of just maligned Eve for, for, what she did uh, this whole time, I th- I think that it definitely was a sin. I'm not saying it's not a sin, uh, you know, to to eat of the tree. But look at look at from her perspective. If this is one of the sons of God, who's a member of God's family, who's enticing you and tempting you, uh, and he says like, you know, it'll it'll make you like one of us. And she was like, I want to be, you know, just like one of one of my brothers in God's family. Uh, knowing good and evil, and I think that she was she was deceived in that. And a lot of the Second Temple rabbis, I believe, don't actually blame Eve as much for that story, uh, or for the proliferation of evil, but they actually blame the Watchers in Genesis six. Yeah. Um, at, for the proliferation of evil. So if you want to say, you know, the woman is is why we have all of this mess, I would say that the Watchers are why we have all of this mess. Um, yeah. And it's, I just, yeah. I, I'm, I'm working on a video right now uh, with Mackie on a podcast, not with Mackie, but with some of his content. And it's this theme that constantly comes up in what he talks about, that the, 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 the theme of the seed of the woman pitted against the seed of the snake. And, you know, the, the God right. puts that curse that, you know, that there's, you know, the first uh, um, uh, um, prophecy, I guess you could say, about the Messiah is that the, the seed of the woman is going to uh, crush the, the seed of the snake, but he'll bite his heel while he crushes his head and you know that dynamic that context that's set up is constantly on display um, as we're going through all the rebellions and and that was the next point that I have up there is not one but three rebellions and another thing in our cultural context is as we grew up we, we were really only told about one and it was a focus on the sin of Eve and Adam and the hu- the human fall, and again, I don't think Heiser sidestepping yeah. it. Mackie yeah. is 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 even much better at, at really focusing on that human side of it, so that we're not you know trying to look like we're skating out of it, but that we're going to take the Bible on its own terms. So uh, before I say any more, why don't you tell people the, the the not one but three rebellions? Yeah, uh, so I think the first rebellion would be the snake. And he is one of the divine council members, one of the sons of God. And he comes and tempts Eve. And he wants to give them this knowledge that, that Yahweh uh, didn't set up. It wasn't time for it yet, I think. It wasn't time to have that knowledge. And the snake tempts Eve, and uh, she gives it to Adam, and, and they eat. And their eyes were opened. 
Um, have you actually, have you talked to Ron Johnson about the fall much or no? I have him on my list. I've actually reached out to him. We've, we've yeah. communicated, and and we're definitely we're gonna get something together. I can't wait. But he's he's a great source of information. Him and Mike Chu. Yeah. Everything that yeah. they're doing uh, with the DCW. So I don't want to get too controversial, but one of the things I found interesting about what we call the fall is that he says specifically, if you eat of that tree, you will die. Not like if you just do a sin, you'll die. And and I wonder if that's something that uh, the New Testament writers are talking about with like some sins lead to death. But I think like the problem that we have is the death problem in the fall. Uh, the so-called fall, and I think that we've kind of emphasized the sin problem so much, and there and there is sin. Like I'm, I'm saying, it is a disobedience to not do what Yahweh wanted. But what that what they did was specifically eat of that tree, which gave them that knowledge, and dispensed that knowledge from the Nachash. And um, then then the second rebellion, like the the Watchers, uh, they come down. It is talked about in Enoch in Genesis six. They they come down the mountain and you've actually one of the interesting things we were talking about Leviticus is that Azazel is actually in that Watcher story in in Enoch. It was yeah. pretty interesting uh, uh, for that. So they come down and Genesis six says that the sons of God uh, married the daughters of men or married however you want to say like took Slept with. or it could yeah. even be. Yeah, or it could even be, you know, some like abuse. Um, but I, th- I think these are theological themes um, that the author of Genesis is doing the three divine rebellions. So the first one is the divine rebellion with the humans and the snake. The second is the humans, the sons of uh, the sons of men and the daughters of men, I mean, and then the sons of God. And then the third one is the Tower of Babel, where it says, come, let us go down and confuse their languages. And one of the things that we've misunderstood about the Tower of Babel is we thought that they're trying to kind of get up to heaven. But what if, you know, the the ancient context of a ziggurat is they're actually trying to have the gods come down to earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's building a ziggurat was your, they actually wouldn't make them with things inside them. The ziggurat that they build is hollow so that the gods can come down and dwell in it. And how much how much of that is just the perversion of what the original Eden is and the temple, you know, the yeah. intersection of heaven and earth. Yeah. So God, God, uh, Yahweh comes down and confuses their language uh, and the council members confuse the language and he sets them over the nations. It's kind of like a, a divorce that uh, Heiser talks about. And that's in you know Deuteronomy thirty two eight is a he a lot allotted the divine beings over the nations to kind of give them that role over the nations because he was just I think that Yahweh was so upset that they didn't want to worship um, worship him you know alone and they they wanted these other gods so I think he was kind of just like okay I'm gonna hit pause on this. Because we talk about the whole story of the Bible where he's reclaiming the nations. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily think that he's like, I'm done with humanity forever, but he's saying, like, all right, I'm done right now. You know, let's hit pause and then I'm gonna I'm gonna kickstart Eden going into the Torah and calling Abraham. Uh so yeah, I mean Abraham's calls right after the the splitting of the nations. Like, you know, how how much does that frame our understanding of Genesis twelve when he says, Go out from your country and your kindred to a land I will show you thinking of cosmic geography, Abraham's like, why would I leave, you know, my territory and worship a God over here when you're supposed to worship the gods of the territories, like in the, in the ancient context. So yeah, that was something that that, uh, Ron Johnson and Mike Chu talked about, I think on their last podcast. So sorry, that was so long of an answer. Dude, That was an amazing answer. That's why I just, yeah. I was kind of just going, you know, a little, hopefully I didn't go too far off. But, no, you yeah. didn't. You went perfectly. And that's a great uh, explanation of the three rebellions and under, understanding them. Um, and the the Tower of Babel, you are, or actually I want to go back to, because what you just connected for me, and man, this is awesome. This is why I love uh, this conversation, is when we were just listing the, the rebellions, 
Um, Mackie's always taught me to really like, you know, put things on top of each other so that you can contrast, compare the, the stories and see what's different, what's the same. And they're alluding to each other, you know, in, in so many different ways. And that first rebellion, I never looked at it through the lens of the second rebellion through like, if we understand the ancient Near Eastern context through Enoch of Genesis 6 to understand that these sons of God came down, um, slept with these women and created the Nephilim. And then we have all the stories through Enoch of the watchers coming and, you know, filling with this, uh, filling humanity with this, this unneeded intelligence that war and all, yeah. all these different That's things. What it's about. When mm -hmm. I reframe that back into the garden and them eating the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that, that brings a whole new insight into that moment of them trying to reach to get that knowledge to become gods. Um, so that was really good. So th thank you for, for your Thanks, explanation yeah. there. I think you did a really great job. Um, and, and one thing that Mike always talked about was Augustine um, you know, removed um, the Enoch context and that supernatural focus. And that's, that's what we've always talked about. Like That's why it's, we have to be purposeful, I think, with, your, with the, the up-and-coming scholarly world, uh, the lay people, everybody out there to make sure that we're just meeting the Bible on its own terms and to see this supernatural yeah. focus. Um, I, I'll say this yeah. quote, I'll say this quote, and then I'll let you speak. Um, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. And sometimes that's what I see within this removal of the supernatural focus. And even when we look back to the removal, what Mike talked about of the snake, of the focus on the, the garden story of the divine rebellion of the snake, it's like this, we see culture and, and, and so many other different ways pulling focus away from it. So anything that you got to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think also what we need to uh, be aware of too is like it's not it's about getting into the worldview of the authors and the culture. It's not about like DNA that the you know the Nephilim or the Watchers like corrupting DNA or or trying to find like giant Nephilim bones, but it's about reconstructing the supernatural worldview that the biblical authors had. And if they're not thinking in terms of science and DNA, I don't think we should be either. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's well said. So on to our next video. Um, this one connects to a recent popular video that you just brought up. You said you were watching um, as 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 we we started the video that we put out about Joe Rogan, uh, Zechariah Sitchin versus the findings of Heiser and biblical scholarship. Uh, we found through Heiser that many like Sitchin and Joe Rogan misuse these ancient Near Eastern texts to promote a flawed ancient alien theory. Let's check this out. Every point, every point in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 has a counterpoint in the Mesopotamian Apkalu story. The Enochian material, the material written after the biblical stuff but before the New Testament, okay, intertestamental, Second Temple Jewish literature, for some reason, and there are academic explanations for this that, that make sense. Again, the quick version is, for some reason, Whoever's writing the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees and some of these other books, the Book of the Giants from Qumran, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, whoever's writing this stuff knew the Apkalu story really well. And they write their version of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 with the Apkalu story in mind. So this is why Enoch has the offending watchers being sent to the realm of the dead and bound because that's what happens to the Apkalu. We don't read that in Genesis 6. We only got four verses there. You get hints of it a little bit later with some of the Rephaim who live in the, in the, in the, in the netherworld and passages like Ezekiel 32. You get a little, little bits and pieces of it. But whoever's writing the Enochian stuff is really well aware of this. And they preserve the original context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So we, we can look at that and we can kind of know, you know, what, what, they're sort of, what they're sort of fishing for because if we know the Mesopotamian Apkalu story, we can read Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and say, okay, sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim, before and after the flood. Okay, we, we know what they're shooting at. But it's the Enoch stuff that adds their punishment.
And that's the stuff that Peter and Jude pick up on and winds up in Peter and Jude. I really like that clip. Yeah, I, I had actually never seen that clip before. Uh, yeah, so I, that, that was pretty cool. It was actually fun making the clips for this because I was just like, man, I get to dig through everything and find the coolest stuff that I because like, I have tons of stuff saved. So yeah, that was that was awesome. So first, before I say anything, your thoughts um, on that clip and the Opkalu connection? Yeah, I think like with the Opkalu connection, Amar Anus was kind of the he was the pioneer, right, uh, of that connection. And Heiser, is it in? I dare you not to bore me with the Bible. He has that little article on um, all your. He, it's called all your Genesis commentaries are eight track tapes right and then he says that no genesis commentary post what was it was it 2015 or 2013 whenever amar Anu's stuff came out that uh anything before that was an eight track tape which is what i found pretty funny but yeah i mean the apkalu as the backdrop of genesis 6 i think is huge um and you can see that all throughout mesopotamian literature if you read if you read some of it yourself um, there's a there's a good little book I think on the last it was either on the first or second interview that Ron Johnson did with Awakening he he shows this little book um, and the, you could go watch that and I can't remember the name of the book right now I could look it up but it's got all of like the Mesopotamian uh, stories that kind of parallel the Old Testament and they've put them there for you of what they think fits together. Uh, so I would recommend picking that up and reading it for yourself, because when you read it for yourself, some of the stuff that Sitchin says is just crazy. Like, I mean, and I know he's doing his own translation, supposed translation work. But I mean, when you're reading it for yourself and you look at the ancient lens of what they knew, looking it through an anthropological lens of like what these people knew, like they didn't know about our modern conception of UFOs, like and aliens coming down to like mute you know make mutant dna like i think that's just ridiculous on, on itself and yeah. and you know these scholars like amar anus and dr heiser are just great at clearing some of this stuff up and i hate to see that you know joe joe rogan on such a popular podcast has kind of fallen into that but i don't i don't really blame him for that so. yeah and the crazy thing is i will give him credit uh to say this for joe rogan he does always quantify it with that this could be a bunch of baloney or something like that but he's just yeah, really right. i remember that yeah mm -hmm. he's he's just really intrigued by it and he pushes it a lot but it's it's i just think it's important because it's like what you said the 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 people who wrote the bible had a different conception of the universe their cosmology we just did a whole series on this was just a completely uh different view than what we have in our modern western context and when you try to force those two together you're always going to have problems and and the bible you know we can discuss this the bible is always in conversation with culture whether you're in the uh, uh hebrew scriptures and it's in the conversation with its ancient near eastern neighbors or we go to the the uh new testament and how it's in conversation with the greco-roman world and culture that it's around itself um but you know I don't know if you can speak to it, but this this Mesopotamian Apkalu connection being like a Hebrew polemic or political witness against uh, the narrative. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I think that it's just awesome to kind of read the Hebrew text in that light when you have that background knowledge that we've uncovered. It's 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 like uh, that's what that polemic is against, and what it's showing is. Uh, the Bible validates the Mesopotamian narrative, but it reconstructs the impact of the spiritual tampering with humanity, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. then what does that have to say about the New Testament, you know, with Jesus, like being the one and only unique son of God, like it, it just flips the whole story on its head, right? <laughs> yeah, and then new creation, yeah. take it there. And that what what that really is is that the reinventate like that's how we can make it into uh, you know our heaven on earth the the, the kingdom come here on heaven at, at, or here on earth as it is in heaven the new Jerusalem um, you know how, how the the you know how that next the new creation is uh, is going to be minus all of that tampering with I guess you could say and yeah I've never even thought about it in that light I think that's really really interesting. And that's what all these things bring. And it's tough at first. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, encourage anybody who's listened to this that it might be just like, wow, that's a lot. It was a lot for me for a while. 
Um, and to really take these things in, you know, we've got lots of videos on them that you can just kind of digest. But when you really understand the Bible in conversation with culture and and take out this Western, modern Western context and see the Bible for what it is, it's right. it's worth the work to get there. And when you see this Opkalu connection, I can just almost remember, like you talk about your watershed moment. I can remember when I was doing editing, like I kept bumping into Heiser talking about the Opkalu and I'm like, I, I just need to listen. I finally got to just really like hear what he's trying to say. And it, I was like, what? <laughs> like it just... You know, it really all the three rebellions, yeah. Genesis six. It just it made everything open up uh, to to understand. If Rogan had that, I mean, yeah, I mean, if Rogan could just read Heiser's work, I feel like his mind would be blown too. You know how 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 much of a curious person he is and an intelligent person. I think. Um, could you imagine Heiser on Rogan? That would be the one. I think that would be the one because I've seen uh, you know personally. I, I watch Rogan a, a little bit. It's kind of like. My, I'm like you, my, my main itch is for biblical information. I just, I love it. Like it, I never get bored with yeah. it. I always want it. It's like, yep. it's like, it's something that just, I love and get into like, I'm, if I'm sitting out back, I'm listening to a podcast. If I'm driving, I am, I am. Uh, all, yeah. all that stuff. Yep. But one of my like, uh, unplugs, exactly. un, one of my unplugs is Rogan because then it's just like, you know, he's a free thinker and just kind of understanding lots of different topics and stuff like that. That's kind of my, one of my only things and I've I've observed all these different conversations that he's been having that I feel like even if he's not 100% receptive it feels like there's some force outside that's coming through like the holy spirit that's trying to speak truth in a lot of these podcasts and I'm not saying that they are a good source of truth but I've just noticed that and you know Heiser right. would have been that's right. what I'm saying Heiser if right now we could just line him up right now after he just had all those different podcasts it would be just like these you know, these things, the, the, the bricks that would come together in the puzzle pieces. So let's go on to our next clip that's going to bring us into the unseen realm. Powers of darkness understand what would happen at the cross. Well, Paul gives us some insight into the way God shrouded his plan for redemption in mystery. We speak the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery, which God predestined before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Do you realize what Paul is saying here? If the forces of spiritual darkness had understood Jesus was coming to give his life as a sacrifice for sin, they never would have had him killed. Even the disciples didn't understand why Jesus had come. Consider how they responded to Jesus when he told them he was going to Jerusalem to die. They were shocked. Peter even rebuked Jesus. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. But he turned around and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Jesus would have none of it. Jesus was on a divine secret mission. The Old Testament leaves clues scattered throughout dozens of places about God's plan, but it doesn't spell it all out in one place. God didn't want the powers of darkness to know the plan. The intelligent supernatural evil beings knew that the prophesied son of David had arrived. Matthew records an encounter. Two demon-possessed men coming from among the tombs met him. They cried out, saying, What do you have to do with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They recognized Jesus, but their words never indicate that they understood what Jesus was up to. The forces of darkness were duped into conspiring to kill Jesus. It was a divinely designed misdirection. Intelligent evil, Satan, demons, the lesser gods, do not know everything. Only God is all-knowing, and He is on our side. Praise Jesus. So first, I want to respond to that awesome thought contained in this clip about Jesus duping the dark powers. Is that something you've wrestled with before? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love the cross as a disarming of the powers. Uh, I think two things that come to mind with that that we've already talked about is the original rebelling 
you know, sons of God from Genesis six, if they're, if they're chained and if that's where Jesus is going from Jude and Peter, what we can infer from that. And he's proclaiming victory over them and like they're, they're confined to chains and a death sentence, but he's like, you didn't expect to see me down here, but guess what? I'm getting out and you're not. I think that that's, that's, that's just an awesome, you know, proclaiming a victory that, some of the, some of the people you know your viewers and you like would understand, but if you were to say that, like just in a classroom, people are gonna be like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> um, and then and then the second thing is the disarming like of the gods of the nations, like the way that you know these other sons of God are set of the nations, and he's trying to um, he's gonna he's gonna put us like over the nations. I think like his death as a disarming of those supernatural powers as well through like dying as a sacrifice for the Gentiles. So the Gentiles can now, you know, come in and inherit the kingdom. That's like disarming the territories. Uh, I mean, the supernatural powers over the territories, like over the Gentiles. So I don't, I don't know if that makes, makes a lot of sense, but those are kind oh, of two does. things that I've been thinking about. Yeah, yeah it does. It's like yeah. it one, one, once this lens, the, the, the biblical lens you put over the Bible, all these things start to pop. And it's, you know, even when I interviewed Ruben Evans, which we're going to talk about him in a second, the guy who produced that clip that we just saw, it's like the one thing that I, I said, what, you know, what did Mike change for you? He's like, I just have never reading the Bible again. It's like every, again, the same, never reading the Bible the same again. Like every time you go into it now, these, these different things pop yeah. and, and you're asking questions and you see yeah. counsel or you see gods and you're like, wait a minute, you know, let's, how does this, how does this work in? Yeah. Yeah. And baptizing like, and making disciples of all nations, you know, like, what does that actually mean with Christ coming now that the Gentiles are included in that and that, you know, his, his, his offering, you know, his life for the for the Gentiles and not only the Jew is just like opens up a whole new world of like reclaiming those nations, like through disarming those powers and like proclaiming victory over them. Like because he ascended. I feel like we always talk about his death and like like we've talked about, the death is so important, but we are all we're forgetting like the ascension over, you know, all of the other sons of God and like to the right hand of the Father, you know, and so I had a teacher once that said, like, it's really it's 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 strange that we don't celebrate the ascension. We celebrate all the other aspects, but the ascension being so so important. And, and when, yeah. was that Moffat? Uh, no, different teacher, but uh, it's actually actually Mr. Carver uh, at Clearwater Christian College down here uh, in Tampa. But he, uh, you know, that was something that he said and always stuck with me. And then when I learned more about atonement um, through the Bible project, you know, really yeah. understanding that that you know. When the ascension is humanity, our humanity, the blood being sprinkled on to the holy of holies, going right. you know, yeah. going into that place, and that's why the spirit could now come back down into right. all of humanity, exactly. and it's just like whoa, like this is a story yeah. that I want to be a part of, and makes and it's so yeah. exciting that that like that's why you know uh, I'm glad we get to share it like this, and it's uh, to the point to go to, to talk this side too is the the evil supernatural powers that are here were there in the the gospels like you know that popped up out of the woodwork you know like Tim Mackey said when Jesus comes in he's like this this uh, uh honing device that just makes them all just like start coming out of the woodwork and you know the things that they were saying like even not just in Matthew or not just the, the demoniac but in Luke 434 uh one of the demons cries out leave us alone what have you to do with us Jesus of Nazareth have you come to destroy us I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And then Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And you can see this kind of like focus throughout the Gospels of things speaking out, uh, knowing who Jesus is, but still curious as to what he's doing, why he's there. And then Jesus always trying to keep things silent and never to be fully known as he's working through. And none of that really made sense to me until you see this, uh, you know, this mission that Jesus has against the the supernatural powers, the divine council, the three rebellions, all of the things that, that he's filling. So um, you, any yeah. comments to that? Yeah. Have you read Jesus and the Forces of Death by uh, Matthew Thiessen? Dude, I've got it on one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah so I, like some of that that you're just talking about is like Jesus healing people. I mean, he wanted people to be healed, but like, that's not the only reason that he healed people was just, just to, you know, fix them up like a doctor. But 
he was also proclaiming his um, dominance or dominion over like the ritual impurity system. Uh, well, not he actually like like Thiessen talks about. He kind of buys into the system, but he's undermining it through casting out these evil spiritual beings and casting out things that cause ritual impurity, like um, you know the woman with the with the flow of blood or uh, people with you know skin diseases. Like it goes, it's just so much more than we ever thought. And one of the things with the unclean spirits uh, that I wanted to talk to you about now that now that we're talking about it is I think Heiser talks about how the unclean term is if if the if these demons are the offspring of the Genesis six watchers and uh, the sons of men, then the term unclean is kind of like a mixing of the two realms together that that shouldn't have been mixed or it's mm-hmm. like a it's like a yeah and, and it goes back to maybe I don't know. I don't know fully about this, but like maybe it goes back to Leviticus, like on why things shouldn't be mixed together, or if like if that's their whole thing. And and in the in the divine realm of like the other ancient Near Eastern societies, like those mixtures are like the Sphinx is like a mixture of, you know, um, what is it, lion and human, and like they have all of all of these things like that. So yeah, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, unclean also being understood through like like death. I think that like. Death is always yeah. against God. Like everything that He has is is uh um you know is life, and and that's what I, I actually just you know unfortunately was a part of uh, um celebration of life for my my um wife's mother, and that was one of the things that I said. You know, death is messed up. It's not. It's not. God, the whole story of the Bible is about God telling us that death is not a part of His program. He doesn't want it close to Him. It's not. It's not a part of life. It's not a part of what we do. And I think that that uncleanness can speak to that death nature, not just that they're, de- they're yeah. dead, but that that's what they're out to create, and that that's what they're they're they're, they're bringing, and that, that that's not a part of God's program, and that will not stand in the kingdom of God. And I think that's when Paul speaks about these things, saying like, you can't enter with that, like that. You're no, you're not going to be able to come in unclean. You're not going to be able to come in with that uh, unholy union. That the only way is to be born again through new creation through Jesus. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if that that helps you at all. Yeah, and like uh, we've just, I feel like we've filtered everything through sin, and it should, you know, like sin is is rebellion against God, and like it needs to be emphasized um against the character of god but when we think of things only in terms of sin and not death uncleanness uh and and like theson talks about all the other categories we're gonna see in leviticus like a woman has to bring a sacrifice because of being unclean from having a baby and it's like well they have to bring a sin offering so how is that sin but we're actually not thinking in the ancient lens of like okay well this represents life and this represents death and it's not sinful to you know have a menstrual cycle or or like have a baby like and and now the sacrifices aren't about paying sin debts but they're about entering into the presence of god and like decontaminating the sacred space so that the spirit you know can come down like so and dwell dwell with us so yeah it's just a totally different paradigm yeah, understanding sin that way, I think, is so good. I'm trying to look for the book. I think it's called The Brevery of Sin, uh, but one that really just helped me uh, understand sin in the light of uh, just missing the mark that that and and the opposite of the shalom of god that that like yeah, yeah. you know yeah, there yeah. We, it's not and again none of this is excusing if anything this is right, more right, right, right. more self uh uh you know self-inflicting wounds of saying that this is us this is what we're doing this is what we're choosing but that that this life itself is missing the mark that's why jesus could say the joy the joy that was set before him he endured the cross you know it's not that this life is a throwaway and that's not the way that the bible presents this either it's to be honored respected revered and given unto god and you know even jesus with with instructing us to pray for god's kingdom to come here on earth as in heaven now not later um but that like it's a foretaste it's a it's 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 a foretaste that's missing the mark because creation's groaning we're groaning we're all in anticipation of this new creation and that that seems off for you know even to my own like mental understanding to be like well what does that mean for this life that that we're in now 
Um, and you know, those are questions you can digest forever, but ultimately they're answered in Christ to know that, that like this life does matter now, but that we have a future joy before us that, that is going to be without the unclean, uh, sinfulness that, that, that maybe we, we misrepresented in our, in our Western culture. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, lastly, I want to close because this is going to tie it all together. This actually works out perfectly. So I want to close with one of a favorite of Heiser's and this channel's, um, the supernatural connection of aliens and the demonic world. Um, this clip that we're going to show really sheds light on why the ancient alien misconception that we've talked about is so important for us to straighten out. My view, personally, again, if we if we take off the table the nuts and bolts kind of discussions about, you know, hey, could there be aliens or not, you know, the academic discourse. If we take that off the table and we talk about the spiritual messaging elements, uh, I think what's going on is we have intelligent beings, intelligent, non-human, divine, spiritual beings, whatever you want to call them, trying to control the language of spirituality. But I think the intelligent evil wants to control and redefine the terminology. They want God redefined as a transcendent extraterrestrial. They want Jesus redefined as a messenger from the transcendent extraterrestrial or an extraterrestrial himself. Uh, they want the need of humanity not equated with sin, a solution for sin, but to evolve, to be a transcendent being like they are. Think about it, if you had the same vocabulary that we use in religious discourse, God, Jesus, salvation, humanity, destiny, transcendence, glorification, heaven, all these things, but they all had different meanings that attached themselves to this whole extraterrestrial question. Well, guess what? You get to keep your Bible. We don't change any of the words. However, what the words mean is something different. This is something akin to, conceptually at least, when the Nahash, the serpent, walks up to Eve and says, hey, did God really say? And then they have a conversation where Eve is misled or misdirected, led to process what God said in a different way. So Heiser is helping us see that the supernatural evil has something to gain with equating God and the spiritual world to ancient aliens or aliens coming to this world. Um, I think this sheds light on everything that we've just talked about with the Mesopotamian Apkalu story and even now this ancient alien theories and how they're both kind of connected, right, um, to spiritual evil. It's like the same story evolved and the Bible speaks out against both. Um, so before I say anything else, uh, any thoughts on that? Matt? Yeah, I think there definitely could be some type of supernatural influence on on, on some of these like conspiracy theories that that we've seen um and one of the things that heiser talks about and i think nt Wright is that we don't have specific language for these powers of darkness um i mean we have the sons of god but we don't know everything that's out there and how do you know that this isn't a spiritual being or how do you know i mean i think that there could be real aliens out there. Um, and and I, one of the things that Dr. William Lane Craig has talked about is like, if there's other extraterrestrial life or there's other intelligent life, I feel like that proves that there is a God that had to have, like there's no way that two, you know, intelligent life forms could exist. And, and I think that like, we just need to be really careful um, that it's not our realm, it's not our territory. And we don't need to like have, you know, have these conversations with whatever beings. Um, but I also think that we need to not not be super scared, like at the possibility of alien life, because I, I, I actually think that there there could be alien life and that we don't need to be uh, super scared about the possibility of that. 
I don't know if that's making making any sense. It's no, kind it of just a caution. Like, let's not say, you know, anything alien is all demonic, but not let's not say that, you know, there are no aliens and I don't know. So, yeah. No, we recently interviewed Matthew Halstead, and that was exactly his sentiment. And I think that that's a, a balanced yeah. way yeah. to approach it and yeah. understand it um, is to say that, like, anything that tries to go against the gospel and to change the way that you view Jesus or you view right. the narrative of God and right. all that we have, that can very easily be called demonic. You know what I mean? Like you don't, yes, you don't have to, you don't I have agree. to work too hard there. Um, and that, that those things, even just like they did when we just talked about with the Mesopotamian context through the Apkalu, when those type of influences were trying to uh, change the way people looked at uh, the ultimate relationship of who God is into people. It's the same way with some of these ancient alien theories and how they misconstrue the Bible stories of Genesis 6 and all those things. But that, even if you take that route, that doesn't mean that God didn't create a universe that could contain life outside of Earth and still have exactly. the entire biblical narrative to be intact. It's really just exactly like right. how We're big, on the same page, yeah. how how big do you want your you know you know what I mean how how much are you going to allow to 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 think and how big is your God, uh, you know really. Um, and when we recently interviewed Matthew House said about the confirmed sightings and reports of otherworldly crafts, so like you're you're talking about this now, and it's come up. I mean, listen, it's everywhere. It's yeah. like you, you you cannot deny. Mm -hmm. Like there's a few things that you can deny, there's but one thing there's something going on now. Our government, the, the, yeah. the reports weird. that we yeah. have. So any any, what are your thoughts on this whole alien thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that like one of the things with the David Grush stuff was that so many Christian jumped on, Christians jumped on it and said like, oh, these are just demons. But I'm like, okay, so what, what is a demon? And the way that we think of demons um, that we've talked about on the show is a little bit different than what other people might think demons are. And, and I've seen some people say, you know, these are like the Nephilim. But if we're understanding the Nephilim like in the scholar scholarly way, like that Amar Honest and Dr. Heiser have suggested, I feel like some of these these sightings or remains or whatever they have, maybe there could be some demonic influence trying. Uh, but I just don't see that that being very likely that if there is some type of alien remain, that it would be like a Nephilim or something like that. I think like with the Sitchin stuff, um, if it's trying to misconstrue the Bible, misconstrue Jesus, that's definitely red flags. And there is another world, and we need to be aware of that and concerned about that. But that doesn't need to be like, you know, everything. And and I think that aliens isn't a threat to God. I think that C.S. Lewis also, like he has an entire space trilogy on this stuff. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Where, where are you on that as well? No, same thing. That's it's it's it's. Yeah. It's being open to that thought and to know to know that like ultimately my hope in Christ is what's going to lead me through all of it because that's what's going to make it yeah unshakable, um, and yeah, that, yeah. that you know that that it, that it doesn't change any of that. But in in reality, it's like person to be honest. Personally, I think a lot of what's going on in and through our government um, and the releases that we have and a lot of this, I, I, I think there's darkness behind it. Personally, I, I do. I do think that there's a chance for a extraterrestrial life and that extraterrestrial life could have already visited our planet and could be visiting our planet, show itself in different ways. But I guess just coming through the government streams, there's just a like, I'm, it's always obscure to me. It's like, why are you telling us this? You said you didn't yeah. want to tell us this. Now you're telling us this, you know, and, 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 and all the different things and that, that when I look back to, you know, even to understand the world through the light of scripture and revelation and the critique on empire that it gives to know that our enemies work through the world's right. empires to deceive people and that that's the critique that I need to understand and keep in mind is that, you know, how far am I going to trust some of these things that they're saying and then to even know some of these things that they're saying whether it's truth or false about alien life, that there's nefarious things like we're talking about of evil behind this empire that's trying to lead us away from our faith in God and and to shake us up and disrupt humanity and and to to pull things back into chaos like the enemy always wants to do. So that yeah, I mean that's 
That's personally where I'm at with it. I, I used to be on the yeah. exact opposite end of it. I used to be more on the end with you and how uh, Matthew Halstead are. Uh, when I first watched Heiser's Alien documentary that Ruben Evans produced as well, um, I was um, I was kind of like upset. I was like, man, I expected him to be like way more like aliens are real or something. Like I just I don't know why yeah, I just I, 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 I expected yeah. that and and it wasn't. So that like as I've kind of gone through it all and just wrestled through it and just thought through it personally, I'm I'm less on the more I'm less on the uh, extraterrestrial side and more on the evil spiritual influence side. And and again, yeah. like yeah. you said, many things I could be swayed. I'm not an expert in any of it, and it's just you know my my yeah, thoughts it's a on hard it. Question. It is. I mean, it, it's one of the questions like of our of our humanity is is there other life? Mm. I think one of the things Halstead. Um, that he's a friend of mine. One of the things that he he puts into light with his interview with was it um, I can't remember his name. Ross Colthart. He interviewed him on his channel, and they're talking about how like with aliens, we already have these categories of like could an alien exist? We already have these categories of an intelligent life form, you know, that's not human, yeah, and that's not Yahweh. Uh, so, I mean, the intersection between those, I think is so hard. And like, like N.T. Wright says, like, don't we don't have lines. good language for the powers yeah. of darkness. So we don't, I don't think we know. I don't think we need to be scared. Um, I don't think we need to say that every alien is a demon. Uh, but there also is, I think some of the stuff Heiser's talking about with the MK ultra, yeah. I haven't researched a ton into that, but that sounds like some demonic stuff based on the, the documentary I watched only. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It's hard to navigate, man. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot, but that we got we have we have we have Jesus. I mean, that's the ultimate thing, victory. It, yeah, it, exactly. It, it's finished. That's what but we're trying to say, yep. I think yeah. it's important to create a safe space for these conversations, and that's what Heiser did right. so well right. um, with yeah. the fringe topics. I say it all the time in his ministry. He created that safe place uh, for the right. weird. And to that point, exactly. I wanted to Very talk good. talk with you about it and and uh, announce again and 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 also get some feedback from you. We've got an awesome. Um, uh, opportunity for Ring Them Bells. We've partnered with Visual First Films, uh, Ruben Evans, uh, the gentleman who produced Unseen Realm, all of Heiser's Angel and Demons and the Aliens documentary, all of them. Um, we're partnering with him and we're going to do a documentary over the life and teachings Super of Dr. Exciting. Michael Heiser. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's an awesome opportunity. And like I'm, I'm blown away at, at, I just recently have been sent all of the uh, B real footage, all the uh, you know stuff that hit didn't hit the editing floor from all the the different documentaries, and I'm like going through it and watching Heiser in these intimate moments. And I'm gonna be really man. A couple times I've cried, like even just like yeah. seeing him in those kind of moments, talking about different things, and it, it's just such a great opportunity. So what do you, what do you think about a documentary on Heiser? I'm super excited. I mean that that just sounds awesome. But yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great moment, and I. Uh, I think we'll we're we're gonna want to get different voices as we're going through. I think even today having having yours is is such a such a welcome thing to understand uh, Heiser's scope and range and reach, um, and we're gonna keep sharing out this material uh, to to help keep his voice alive. But before we go, I wanted to take a second and let you share some closing thoughts. Um, plug your YouTube channel. Tell us about your illustrated Bible series and anything else you'd like to tell us about Robert. Yeah, so uh, my Illustrated Psalms book is for people who are just learning Hebrew, or if you know Hebrew and you want to study the Psalms devotionally in its original language, like we've been talking about this whole time with cultural context. And I think that if you go to seminary, a lot of people have this experience where the language learning is so hard. It's all about formulas and like parsing and breaking things down with like, okay, this is a definite article. This is call imperfect. This is three, you know, third feminine, but let's just step into the worldview of the biblical authors and try to read these languages with their accents and, and their dialect and worship God through the meditation of the Psalms through that. So I've got a, I've got a YouTube channel and I have a playlist of Hebrew music. It's just called Hebrew music that you could kind of read along the Psalms, listening to them and have the illustration of, of the Psalm that um, I worked on a lot of the illustrations. And then Dr. Carmen did the translation on that one. 
And then my Leviticus one is for the same series. Uh, Dr. Carmen did the Exodus one. And it's basically like a comic book of, of the entire book of Exodus uh, that she did. And I'm doing Leviticus. And our translation on the bottom as kind of a cheat if you need it. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's like it's like a comic book of of the original language. And the speech bubbles are all in Hebrew for people who uh, want to, you know, sharpen their Hebrew skills. Yeah, I'll have and, links uh, to everything yeah. in the in the notes. I'll have links to everything the the oh, the, yeah, the, sure. the both of those because I I want to pick those up. Um, I didn't. I've I saw them when you did. Uh, also, we're gonna quick plug Disciple Dojo uh, that we uh, already mentioned uh, uh, that featured Carmen Imes in that interview. He's awesome. Definitely check their channel out. Dr. Carmen Imes has her own YouTube channel that is incredible. Um, she does a really great job of bringing historical context and these bite-sized clips on Torah Tuesday that she's gone through the entire Torah. They've been very influential for me. I can't recommend them enough. Um, and then also we're going to have the links uh, from Robert's uh, work. I want to pick those up because when I saw uh, uh, Dr. Imes, she had um, Robert on Torah Tuesday, and he was showing these illustrated uh, commentaries on Psalms and Leviticus and they looked awesome. I'm a comic book nerd, so I'm I'm definitely picking oh, some up great. myself, man. Yeah, thanks. So uh, working on Leviticus now, you know, translating right now. So yeah, in the thick of it. So well, Robert, thank you so much for being here with us today. I've never been more excited about the future of biblical scholarship after our conversation, thanks. man. Like you really did uh, an incredible job, encouraged me, and this has been one of the most free flowing conversations that I've had in an interview. And I got to say, okay. man, I've really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah. Do you go to uh, like Bible scholar conferences at all or no? I have like the SBL. I'm going to SBL this year. The past two years, each year, something has just come up to where I could absolutely could not. But I'm like I'm in, so I'm definitely going this okay, year. So we'll right. have to yeah. we'll have to hook up and, and, yeah. and connect for sure, man. Well, let me close us in prayer and pray for you and your ministry and uh, and the rest of what God has in store for your life, Father God. Uh, we thank you so much for what you've done for us here. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come forth and talk about these things. We thank you for the wisdom that you've brought from these amazing teachers uh, like Dr. Carmen Imes, like uh, Michael Heiser, Tim Mackey, and all the people that we've mentioned. Lord, thank you for these wise men and women that you've put in front of us. Um, we pray that we can be wise stewards of the information that you've given to us to go out into this world. Um, we pray to be a part of you uh, putting right in this world and bringing your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. I am so excited and grateful for this conversation that we've had with Robert today. God, I pray that you would bless him. I pray that you would just put your hands upon his ministry and his life and that you would further his work um, so that he can go out and share these truths and be a part of of that putting back right project that you're doing in this world. Thank you for the connection that you brought here today. I pray for that as well, that you would strengthen it um, and that this wouldn't be the last time that we get to meet with Robert. Bless us both as we go, Lord. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are out. Up until this point, this being, this entity, Satan, has owned everyone and everything. But I'm here to tell you that if you are a member of the kingdom of God, this being, Satan, has no claim on you at all. It's as though the prosecutor has been thrown out of court. God doesn't need to hear what you've done. He doesn't need to hear why you deserve death. He doesn't need to hear that death is your destiny. If you embrace me as Messiah and you join the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, problem solved. He has no claim on you at all. And so this, my ministry, my message, is the beginning of him losing ownership of the world. This is where it begins. What spiritual warfare is, is the growth of the kingdom of God, the Great Commission, and the diminishing of the other kingdom. And the way that's accomplished is telling truth. You speak truth to lies.